Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul O'Neill, and on behalf of Kingston's Buried Treasures, I'd like to welcome you to this month's presentation in our lecture series. Um, and I also want to thank everybody for braving the Arctic winds to come down uh, tonight. It, it's absolutely freezing out, and it says something about everyone here that you all uh, braved the cold to come here, and it shows the pioneer spirit of <laughs> Kingston. Uh, so you all have much to be proud of, and, and we're glad to have you here. Uh, at the, our subject tonight is General Sherman Hasbrook, and General Sherman Hasbrook also exhibited that pioneer spirit that we all are, are embracing tonight. Um, so uh, we're going to learn a little bit about Sherman Hasbrook, and we're also going to learn a little bit about West Point. Um, West Point was an incredible part of Sherman Hasbrook's life. In fact, it, it really played a, a formative role in his life, and it remained during the rest of his life one of the most cherished achievements uh, and he held it very dear. In fact, when he died, he was the oldest living graduate of West Point, and uh, he was very proud of that fact. So we are going to learn a little bit about West Point, and then we're going to learn a bit, little bit about uh, Sherman Hasbrook's time there as well. And who better to have as our featured presenter tonight than uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman L. Fleek. Uh, uh, Colonel Fleek is the uh, command historian for West Point, and he has had quite a career in the military as well. He retired after 25 years in the United States Army, during which time he served as an aviator, a special forces officer, an enlisted armored crewman, and he ended his career as chief historian of the National Guard Bureau. Uh, he was a commander of several units, and he served two joint tours, he and he served in combat arms units from platoon through division. He's a native of Utah, uh, he went to Brigham Young University for his undergraduate degree in English, and he got his master's in American history from the University of Colorado. He served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Idaho. He's married, has five children, uh, three boys and two girls. He also has more than 30 articles of a, a wide range of subjects that have been published. He has a number of books. His first book was the award-winning History May Be Searched in Vain, A Military History of the Mormon Battalion. And his second book, Place the Headstone Where They Belong, is a biography of Thomas Niebauer. Did I pronounce that correctly? Niebuhr. Niebuhr, uh, who was a World War I recipient of the Medal of Honor. Uh, his latest book is called Saints of Valor, uh, Mormon Medal of Honor Recipients. Um, he's also served from 2002 to 2005 as a historian for the Civil War Preservation Foundation. Uh, in 2005, the U.S. Army appointed uh, Colonel Fleek as the historian to record and write the Army's official history of the reconstruction effort in Iraq. Um, he served in Iraq in, two in early 2006, and in May of 2007, he became the first ever historian for Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Um, in 2009, he again was appointed command historian for uh, West Point Academy. Um, he has a number of awards, including the Legion of Merit, Defense Mator uh, Meritorious Service Medal, Meritorious Serv Service Medal, and eight other decorations. Uh, the Mer Master Aviator Badge, there is a number of things. Uh, I could really go on for quite a long period of time, but he's also been an incredibly wonderful guy to deal with. Uh, we've had a number of conversations. He was most gracious to come here and speak to us about the about Sherman Hasbrook. And he also brought along with us two special and honored guests. We have uh, Cadet David Cor uh, Corper, who's from K uh, Kentucky, and he's a junior, but they uh, have special designations in West Point. He's a cow. Is that correct? Sealed up here. There you go. And we have uh, Cadet Nikel uh, Casador. Kisa Casador. I apologize. She's from Washington, and she's a yearling, which is a sophomore for the rest of us. All right. So we are very proud to have you here, and we're very proud to have as our feature presenter, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman Fleek. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, when I do these wonderful events with great groups like this. <laughs> And uh, people introduce me. I, I'm thinking, who is that guy? I don't know who he is. <laughs> I don't remember any of this stuff. It's pretty interesting. 
So um, it's an honor to be here tonight. And I understand this is uh, three hours, is it? I have three hours? <laughs> okay. Right. I got plenty of stories. Okay. <laughs> but more like 40 minutes, Paul? Okay. So I just can't tell you how great it is to be among a group where the rubber meets the road, people who love history, people who are local. And that's the good local, not the bad local, okay? <clears throat> you didn't laugh. You're supposed to laugh at my jokes. <laughs> And, um, and, and historical societies and groups and literary groups and so on. It's just, just outstanding. So I had the great honor to bring two um, cadets that I know. And I, I just think the world of them. And, and um, so <clears throat> if you're wondering why this young man's a cow, I'll tell you. <laughs> and next year, uh, Nikhil will be a cow, um, barring other aspects of her life. But anyway. So anyone raised on a dairy farm here? My uncle had a dairy farm in southern Utah. So you, you milk the cows in the morning, right? Old dark 30. And you feed them oats and grains, and they go out to pasture grasses all day, right? And then they come back. Do you herd them in back to the barn? No. They come on their own. Why? Because they want to be milked again, and they're starving for oats and grain again because they've been eating pasture grasses all day. So until World War I, the time period where General Hasbrook was serving or uh, entered West Point, they didn't leave West Point for the first two years. The summer of their sophomore to junior year, they had a 60-day furlough. This is back from the time of Robert E. Lee, Grant Sherman, Pershing, all these guys, MacArthur, up to World War I. So they were allowed to go home. There was no obligation to come back. <laughs> Two years of free education, no obligation to come back. And the other three classes, so a class graduate, these guys go home, another class comes. There was three classes there that summer. They would line the road. If you've been to West Point, there's a hill that goes down to the dock, the south dock where the railroad station is, and they would line the road. And they are all come back the same day, whatever it is, 28th of August, 24th of August. School starts in a day or two. And they would line the road and greet them. Oh, there's David, there's George, there's Sam. Oh, where's, where's Steve? Steve didn't come back. So the cows go out, the cows come back. <laughs> is that true? Did I just make this one up? No, I, that's, that, you, you heard it from me before. <laughs> so anyway. That's the story behind it. What I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, the first few slides is just um, uh, what, I, what I normally do with folks, a brief history of West Point. Who has been down the academy? Raise your hands. OK. Oh, you've been there too? OK. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Who has not been to the military academy? Everyone's visited there? OK. All right. So here we go. Beautiful structures. The chapel, 1910. The barracks, 1965, 1969. Uh, by the trees, behind the two trees, you see a corner of the mess hall, which is Washington Hall. Um, those buildings makes a V. And, the, and Washington Hall, the, the um, mess hall, were all built in the 60s because of a football game. Guess what game? Army Navy, 1962. Who was President of the United States in 1962? JFK. So first half of the game, Philadelphia, he sits with the midshipmen, OK? Well, this is Kennedy, PT-109, Mr. Navy, right? So you've all seen the movie Cliff Robertson, right? You guys knew Cliff Robertson? OK. <laughs> There's a generational thing here. It's wonderful. So PT-109, got the Navy Cross. Second half, he comes over and sets by General William Westmoreland, two-star general, later commanded in Vietnam. And, um, and he says to General Westmoreland, why are there so many more Navy midshipmen than Army cadets here? Well, if you're sitting for three hours elbow to elbow with the commander in chief, you're going you're gonna to pump him for everything you got, right? So he said, Mr. President, I'm glad you asked that question. And he explained the Air Force and Naval Academies were authorized 4,000 students, the Army 2,500. Well, the president says, we're going to have to fix that. So this is 1962. What happened next year in 1963 to President Kennedy? He's killed. 
So LBJ becomes president of the United States. They pass a law. Everything at West Point is tied to money. Everything, of course. Everything in the government is tied to money. And you need appropriation from Congress, a law to change the amount of students. And that's what happened. 1964, bill went through. $11 million in 1964 uh, money. We built Eisenhower barracks. MacArthur Barracks, we extended the mess hall, and then Bradley Barracks with $11 million. Today that would pay for, uh, what would it pay for? Hmm, $11 million uh, sticky notes for three years and maybe <laughs> a lot of pencils and pens and a few laptops, you know? <laughs> Just kidding. So I hit the down arrow, right? The right one. Okay, that's me. So this is an image above um, on Thayer Hall. Thayer Hall was an indoor writing arena. And what happened on this date? Some of you were around. Most of you were around. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So who said those words? Neil Armstrong. And who were the other two crew members on Apollo 11? Okay, Mike Collins and Buzz Aldrin. And guess where they went to school? Did you know two of the three astronauts on Apollo 11 were graduates from the United States Military Academy at West Point? Is that not amazing? So Aldrin went down on the ground, and Collins was in the other thing orbiting. So they took commissions in the Air Force. Why do you think they took commissions in the Air Force in 1951 and 1952? Because there was no Air Force Academy. No Air Force Academy until 1959. So they both rose to the rank of colonel in the Air Force. About 20 years ago, we had an official ceremony forgiving them, OK? <laughs> but we love them today. They're still around. They're still with us. We've had 18 astronauts graduate from the United States Military Academy. All right. So what's interesting about the United States Military Academy, and as you know, I'm not a graduate. I went to another university. I was going to say something sarcastic and disrespectful who has a winning record in football, but I won't say that. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> so the motto of the school I went to, and, and uh, Paul read it out loud, it was, if you're going to bring them, bring them young, okay? <laughs> I heard that from a... I felt it when I was going through the aviation advance course. His name was Major Anton. He loved Sun Tzu, the, the Chinese uh, theorist, military theorist. We called him Wontong Antong, but anyway, <laughs> he was funny. So uh, <clears throat> the important thing about the military academy is not what happens on now 16,000 acres of land. What is important is what these graduates do after they leave the academy. All right, that's the important thing to understand. So here we have this poster. And can you read the words up there on the top of the poster? It says, we at West Point, much of the history we teach was made by the people we taught. So right now, I'm teaching Millard. And I just want you to know, I'm the command historian. I'm not a professor. I don't hold a PhD. I'm not on faculty. I'm responsible for the history of West Point. The annual history I finished last year, 350 pages, is absolutely unequivocal boredom, OK? Just really boring stuff. Uniform changes, curriculum this, we hired new professors. They finally got the sewage system fixed, you know, and this other building got heating. Boring stuff, you know, really. But if you're doing deep research 20, 30 years from now, some interesting stuff. You see trends and so on. Um, so I'm responsible for the history of West Point as a non-graduate. What an honor and a privilege it is for me to be here. So if you think about some of the people who've walked across the famous plain, Jefferson Davis, who was he? Yeah. President of the Confederacy. Here in this picture, we have Robert E. Lee at the bottom of the totem pole. Above him is who? U.S. Grant, President of the United States. Eisenhower, President of the United States. 
Douglas MacArthur. He's kind of in his own realm, okay? We're going to talk about MacArthur here a little bit. And I've learned with people, Americans, unlike the Japanese, unlike the Filipinos, unlike the Australians, unlike the Koreans who love this guy, in America it's 50-50 at best. It's like George Custer, you hate him or love him. Well, I have the absolute strong admiration for General MacArthur. Now, he's got a baggage train that follows him everywhere he goes, and it's a long one. But uh, we'll talk about him a little bit tonight. But it's not what happens at West Point that's important. It's what they do after they leave. Presidents, generals. Who's heard of Lucius Clay? Anyone ever heard of Lucius Clay, class of 1917? Who was he? What did he do? He was right under Ike, military governor of Germany, Berlin Airlift. That was his baby. He executed the Marshall Plan in Germany. MacArthur in Japan had no Marshall Plan. There, no, there was no appropriation for him. He took it out of his own army budget and rebuilt Japan without the Marshall Plan. Philippines, Korea. So Lucius Clay. So um, <clears throat> about two days after Memorial Day, I walk through the cemetery at West Point, and I see this reef at Lucius Clay's grave. All right? And it's a nice reef and everything. It's got a flag on it. But it wasn't the American flag. Guess what flag it was? The German flag. The national flag of the Bundesrepublik Deutschland today. And at his footstone, and if I can say this in German the way I memorize it, wir danken dem Befehrer unserer Freiheit. We are thankful for the protector of our freedoms. 1978, and it was Berliner Berger, the citizens of Berlin. 114 American aviators died during the Berlin airlift, and Lucius Clay did it. Who's been in New York City? Isn't there a bridge there named Gothels or Gothels, right? Gothels Bridge? And who's that named after? George Washington Gothels, class 1880 engineer. He single-handedly, with his entrenching tool, dug the Panama Canal. Do you believe that? He finished it. He had 46,000 people working for him down on the Panama Canal. In August of last year, was the centennial of the transit of the first ship through the locks and everything, Panama Canal. Changed the world, the Panama Canal. Amazing feat. I don't know if we have any engineers here. We have a future engineer of America. But um, there's an incredible engineering feat, the Panama Canal. One of the first things he did is he put in a railroad you're going to move dirt. Why use donkeys and mules? He put in a railroad. Two years. I don't know if he's under budget, but he was two years ahead of time. I mean, I could just go on. Governors, all this. Just, just astronauts, I already mentioned that. But it's what happened here uh, as they left West Point and served. And if we talked about generals, we'd be here all night. So a little bit of review. Um, I showed um, the Duke cadets on the way up this picture. Um, what's interesting, uh, the building that's white with all the square windows is Pershing. It was an academic uh, building, 1895, and is finished. To the right is a smaller building. It has a, a, a rain gutter thing coming off and a black door. That's called the sinks. The sinks. You know what I mean by the sinks? Latrines showers, sinks. So the barracks is over here. It's hard to see. Man, I'm going to tear up the world here. It's hard to see. This is part of the barracks, okay? And um, so if you had to go to the bathroom at 2 o'clock in the morning, you had to go down the stairs, cross the central area, go into the sink's dark door there, do your thing, then go back, you know? And you had to be in uniform. So guess what you wore? Your West Point robe with a big A on it. All right? <laughs> MacArthur died at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 1964 in his West Point robe. I got a picture of it. So what's West Point famous for? 1878, established as a garrison. 
because in 1877, a guy named Sir Henry Clinton came up here and burned this town, right? On the 13th of October, is that the sacred day? 13th, 17th, did I get it wrong? I, I read 13th, but okay. <laughs> 1777, and then he found out that Burgoyne had surrendered at Saratoga and he beat feet and went back to New York City. So we set up, the Americans, the Patriots, set up a garrison at West Point. We've had continuous troops there since 1778. January 29th, Samuel Parsons, Canadian Brigade, crossed the ice from Constitution Island, got up on the plane, set up the tents, and they built Fort Putnam and Clinton and all these. These forts here, you can see the different forts. They're trying, they are, they are star points, and the chain that went across the river. So it's an amazing story. The British never taught, tried to take West Point physically um, or uh, by arms. However, a guy named Benedict Arnold tried to sell it to him in 1780 for 20,000 pounds sterling, which is about $4 million today. And that was uncovered because his accomplice, Major John Andre, was captured down at Terrytown by three militia. Anyone serve in the U New York National Guard here at all? Militia, guard? So that's what it is today, the National Guard. And they strip searched Andre because he was in civilian clothes. And the first thing you do, you take the coat off, you take the boots off, and in his boot were the maps, the plans, the diagram, all the aspects of the guard duty, the guard post, uh, ammunition, where the troops were, the manning documents, and it was all provided to him by Arnold. That very morning, who shows up at Arnold's quarters across the river? from West Point on an unexpected inspection tour, George Washington. And where's General Arnold? Oh, sir, he took his barge across the river, go inspect West Point. Oh, by the way, we got this uh, cover letter from a uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pearson, and he's down at Terrytown, captured some guy named John Anderson, alias John on, uh, Andre, and he says he's on Sir Henry Clinton's staff, and so all George Washington did was peruse that, those documents and knew that Arnold was a traitor. So at West Point today, we have a plaque honoring Benedict Arnold. Isn't that amazing? It's in the old Cadet Chapel, 1836 building. We have all the general officers from the Revolution. Henry Knox, Hugh Mercer, uh, Ethan Allen, uh, not Ethan Allen, um, Morgan, Daniel Morgan, all, all these different generals, Lafayette, and so on. There's one plaque that says, Major General, born, 1740, but there's no name on it. That's Arnold's plaque. No one said we had to put his name on it, okay? So there you go. Um, so it's the longest continuous active duty post in the United States Army, in the United States military. So the fifth superintendent was Sylvanus Thayer, class of 1808. Before coming to West Point, he uh, graduated and got a degree from Dartmouth and uh, he's from uh, Massachusetts and he's our longest serving superintendent 16 years our first graduating class was in 1802 the same year West Point was established that graduating class was half Jewish half Jewish there were two graduates <laughs> Joseph Swift, <laughs> I, maybe he's a Christian, I don't know what he was, and then Simon Levy, who was of the Jewish faith, so it was half Jewish, and uh, so on. So until Thayer arrived in 1817, after the um, War of 1812 ended in 15, and he was in France for two years studying, perfecting his, his uh, French, and also buying all the textbooks he could, um, and engineering books and manuals and science books and mathematic books and everything uh, that, and going to the French military academies, um, he came back. And so then he established what we call the Thayer Method. And these people love, these two guys, the, these two cadets, they love what the Thayer Method is. And when they have a hard week, three papers due, two tests, and uh, four presentations in one week, you call it a what? A Thayer Week. Every day was gentlemen to the board. So the ladies didn't arrive till 1976. And what year was 1976? The bicentennial. First graduating class, 1980. 
119 young women started in 76 and 62 graduated four years later. So it was gentlemen to the board. So every day you got up there and you had to conjugate your French verbs or do your math formulas or science this or whatever, your tactics this, every day to the boards. If you didn't know your lesson, it was pretty apparent. You got a failure for that day and your grades were posted every week and your class ranking in every class was posted every week. All right, now they post it what? Once a semester? Okay, see, it's a kinder, gentler West Point, all right? So there revolutionized everything. Four years, upperclassmen, firsties. First class, second class, third class, fourth class. Fourth class is freshmen, we call them plebes now. And the third class is sophomores, we call them yearlings or yucks. And Nikhil is a yearling. There's nothing yucky about her, okay? And then cows are second classmen, okay, or juniors, and then the seniors are our firsties. Tomorrow night is the 100th night, big um, extravaganza, play, banquet, all that. It's roughly 100 days from graduation. At West Point, we have a tradition for every tradition imaginable. I was asked in a TV program one time about listing all the traditions. I said, you have three hours? I mean, uh, take that long. So we have a lot of traditions, and it's wonderful. Their method, first engineering college in the United States. So who was president in 1802 when a West Point was established, who signed on the dotted line approving, I heard it, approving the academy, under the auspices of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. All the superintendents were engineer officers till 1866, a year after the end of the Civil War. Dillafield, Richard Dillafield, Dillafield Road, Dillafield Pond. There was an engineer. Robert E. Lee was an engineer. To, I took a commission as lieutenant colonel in 1855 as in the cavalry. But all of them. De Russi, have you ever been to Hawaii? There's Fort De Russi by the punch bowl. Um, all these gentlemen were all engineers. So oral recitations, class merit, standard classes, everyone took all the classes and they passed them. Now today, these two young people, <clears throat> They have to take at least one or two or three engineering courses, right? Even if you're a non-engineering major, and there's 38 majors, Russian, English, um, all types of engineering, um, history. All right, so now we're getting to uh, the person we all want to talk about for a few minutes tonight, uh, Sherman V. Hasbrook. He's got a great first name. He has a wonderful first name. You know what Sherman means? Sherman, shearing sheep. And my grandfather in southern Utah was, guess what? A sheep herder. So it means sheep herder or, uh, or a shearman or sheep herder, you know, like that. Sheep herder. That's what it means. And um, so it's interesting in that um, he's a, a local boy that gets a a nomination, and that's what they're called, an appointment to United States Military Academy. After four years, they're commissioned as an officer in the United States Army. Some of, for years and years, and we still do it, there's eight or 10 cadets each year that seek commissions in the Air Force or the Navy, and at all the other academies they, they trade. It's kind of interesting. So what happened? He arrived here in 1918, summer 1918. And there was a huge shakeup that West Point was just almost finished with. We graduated, and I'm counting them, one, two, three, four classes in a year and a half. What happened in April 1917? We entered World War I against Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the other nation was uh, Bulgaria, all right? And so... Something's happening now. Windows is coming up. And so because the need of officers, they graduated all these classes early. The class of 1917 had always been the first week of June for about 100 years. The first week of June ever since there. It's interesting. I just thought of that. If they arrived in 1817, now we got 18, 1917, 100 years later, 
and they move it from June. So the class of 17 graduated in April 1917. Then the class of 18 graduated in August of 1917. So you have two classes graduate three months apart. So one did almost four years, the other one did not quite three years, or a little more than three years. Then in 19, the class of 1919 graduated in June of 1918. And then the class of 1920 um, was supposed to graduate uh, in 1920, but it graduated in November 1918. This is not the same class of 1920 that Sherman Hausbrook was a member of. It's a different class. It was one November 1918 that they graduated about 400 cadets, took the oath of office as officers, all right? What happened 10 days later on the 11th? The armistice. Now, I was born in 1955, but until 1954 it was called what? What holiday was it? Armistice Day. Okay, then it became Veterans Day in 1954. Isn't that interesting? So it ended on the 11th hour, 11th day, the 11th month, 1918. Kaiser Wilhelm said, I've had enough. And Hindenburg and Ludendorff and all those guys. So the class that just graduated 10 days earlier, it's one of the few times that democracy, democracy ruled. Half of them, could leave right then and go to the army and half of them chose to stay and graduate or finish the coursework through June. They were commissioned officers. They were second lieutenants, about 400 of them. So it was about 200 and 200 is basically what happened. So, um, so the class split, the others graduated and then Sherman Hasbrook shows up along with uh, 271 future um, classmates of his in June of 1918. And he graduated two years later. He graduated in two years because there was a war emergency act affecting the two military academies, Navy, the Naval Academy and the United States Military Academy trying to push officers out. It's interesting that this is, this war more than anything else gave birth to the ROTC program. Do you know what the admissions or the um, um, percentage of uh, accessions, we call it accessions in the Army of officers each year is, what the break ground percentage? 25% comes from the military academy, 25%. That's a big number from one school, all right? About 15% comes from officer candidate school, former enlisted, two years of college, to go through a year of training, become an officer. There's no, there's no classes or, of um, academics other than officership and training and so on. Okay, so is this, all right, I know what to do. I, I got it, I got it. Even people from Utah have a little bit of a, there we go. Cruising along, I got this slide. There we go, there you go, here we go. So you can see the class of 17, as I explained. Class of 17, graduated in April. Class of 18, graduated in August of 17. Who was in class of April of 1917? Matthew Ridgway, airborne commander. Uh, took over from MacArthur, and MacArthur was fired by Harry S. Truman in uh, April of 1951 because MacArthur stupidly um, went against policy. There's good reason why he did, but <laughs> but he challenged the United States government. So Matt, Matt Ridgway, and two years before 15, uh, in 15, class of 1915, Bradley, Omar Bradley, Eisenhower, Van Fleet, Stratemeyer, Spots, aviators and others, the class the stars fell upon. 161 graduates in that class, 1915, 59 became general officers. Something came along called World War II, all right? So you can see the breakdown of the classes. So, so in 1919, after Sherman, I love that name, had been there a year, guess who shows up as superintendent? Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur, youngest Brigadier General in the Army. 
single, not married yet, he introduced what we call intramural sports and what these two would call company sports today. All right. When I first arrived here six plus years ago, six years ago, I was amazed walking from Buffalo Soldiers Field down by their hotel up the beautiful walkway and you got the, the wall, retaining wall, and you can look down on the Hudson and all the officers' quarters on the left. It's just beautiful. About a mile, you're going up to the main campus. And I passed all these cadets walking down to Buffalo Soldiers Field with helmets and pads. They're playing intramural football. Alpha, Alpha Company 3rd Regiment is playing Delta Company 4th Regiment in football, and they're in pads and helmets and referees. Then about three years ago, they changed it to flag football. Too many knee injuries. This is what Douglas MacArthur envisioned. He loved sports. He believed in sports. Now, we're not talking NCAA. There was no NCAA in 1919. All right? Now, what became NCAA or intercollegiate sports is Army playing Navy, Army playing Dartmouth, Army playing Cornell, Army playing Harvard and you know Notre Dame, those kinds of teams, but then it got codified later in, the, in this program. But this is intramural sports, company sports. Still today, volleyball, name some of the sports. Volleyball, basketball, frisbee, frisbee touch, football. touch football, all kinds of stuff. Softball, no softball. Swimming, all, all these things. So if I can paraphrase exactly what Mark Arthur said, on the fields of friendly strife are sold the seeds that on other fields and other days um, bear the fruit of victory. He saw in World War I the importance of physical training and physical fitness because of the demands of combat. He also realized that an 18-acre plot mostly taken up by a baseball field and they played football there too they used to play football on the on the plane was not the best place to train soldiers future officers for combat operations that he saw in france with artillery and tanks and aircraft so he motored all the cadets down to fort monmouth to do real training and all the old colonels the guys had been the 20 years, 25, 30 years, the professors and heads of the department said, this is sacrilege, we can't do this. Robert E. Lee was on the plane. Grant was on the plane, Pershing was on the plane. That's it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. MacArthur said, no way. So he moved them down there and they trained with real soldiers at Fort Monmouth. And as soon as he gave up his superintendency, guess what happened? They changed it back. But now, all we do is march on the plane, and these young people go all over the world, train with army units in Germany or Korea or at the National Training Center of Fort Irwin, California, or Fort Polk, Louisiana, or Fort Riley, Kansas. Three weeks, they're with real soldiers, and they do real soldier training, plus other things. Then we have the summer training down uh, along the range road is what I call it. We have Camp Buckner's and Camp, Camp Natural Bridge where we do a lot of summer training. He established the honor code. And the honor code is a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal. That was it until 1970. He established that. 1970, we added the no tolerance clause or tolerate those who do. Did I say it right? I said it right. So he established that. Before that, if there was an egregious offense, it went court-martial, Articles of War. Now we call it UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice, Articles of War. We still have the UCMJ. Sometimes cadets do steal cars and do silly, stupid stuff. And then they, are, they can be arrested and, and brought up on charges and dismissed or go to jail. Now, an honor violation is, is important and it's critical, but it's not criminal. It's an honor violation. You're supposed to be at track practice. You tell everyone you're, you've got some other thing. You're supposed to be there at track, but you go do something else, and then you lie about it. So there's two violations. You're not where you're supposed to be, which is kind of an honor thing. 
then you lie about it. So the honor code is, is an important thing, and he established it, General MacArthur. So Sherman Hasbrook was there when it was first introduced because it, w it happened that year, 1920. So these are some of the interesting things that Sherman Hasbrook saw. So 209 cadets entered with him on uh, the 14th of uh, June, 1918. The war was still raging um, in France. 47 others came in later that summer, two dates in July. The top graduate was James B. Cullum. He's the nephew of George Washington Cullum. See that GW Cullum? George Washington Cullum established what is called, well, we have Cullum Hall today. He married his rich boss's wife after his rich boss died. Okay, you may know of uh, um, Henry, um, <clears throat> Henry Halleck during the Civil War, worked for General, uh, well, he was, he was the boss of Grant and then Grant became his boss. Uh, and he was kind of an acting chief of staff for the Union Army, um, Halleck. They called him Brains Halleck, class of 19, uh, 1837. All right, so he made millions of dollars in California before the war, millions. He had a steamboat line, railroad lines and stuff. He marries Elizabeth, he dies. George Washington Cullum marries her, has all of his former boss's money. So when he dies in 1892, he gives $250,000 to West Point to establish a memorial hall. We call it Colum Hall today. He was superintendent for two years, 1864, 1866. He came up with what is the register of cadets and graduates. So when these two fine cadets graduate, they will get a column number. So Hasbrook's column number is 6682. The Navy doesn't do this. They don't know how to count. I don't know why, but so who, the GOAT, and you know what the GOAT is? You've heard that term? The GOAT is the bottom of the class. Okay, the GOAT of the class of June 1861, graduated two classes in the spring of 1861. What was happening in 1861? Civil War just started, so again, we accelerated. The GOAT of 1861, June, was a guy named George Armstrong Custer, all right? He got a no-go at the Little Bighorn. He didn't show up for retraining for some reason. <clears throat> and uh, the next guy, and he was column number six, uh, uh, 1867, 1867. The guy 1868 was the top of his class in the class of 1862. That's the way it works, okay? Column number. Column didn't call him that, but that's what we call it. I don't know if you folks have heard about the column numbers. But whenever I give a tour at West Point and uh, someone uh, starts talking, I can tell they're a graduate and it's, they get a little pointy, it's kind of interesting, it's fun. I said, okay, so what's your column number? Well, uh, uh, bitty, bitty. it's not quite like your social security number, you don't use it every day. But uh, so that's his column number. He graduated 142nd out of 271. I'm gonna pass around the curriculum. This is interesting, so you can put this in your treasures of truth, okay? David, do you pass these around? This is the curriculum, the year that, that Hosbrook graduated, okay? So it's uh, 20 and 21. And you can see what kind of classes they took. And I know some of you know a lot more about Sherman Hosbrook than I do, but this, is, uh, this you can have, and you can see the, the classes that they took um, at that time. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. Some of his classmates, Lyman Lempnitzer. He was Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff. He commanded the 7th Infantry Division during World War II. Um, he was Chief of Staff of the Army. Then he was a Chairman in the 1960s. And who's heard of Earl Red Blake? What was he? He was a football coach for 27 years, you know. During his time as coach, there were two Heisman Trophy winners, Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis, 44 and 45. And West Point, the glory years, was national champions, 44, 45, 46. Then we had another Heisman in, in 58, and he graduated in 59, and his name's coming to me. Uh, Pete Dawkins, yes, Pete Dawkins. I took him on a tour about eight months ago. I was so nervous Pete Dawkins was gonna go on a tour with me. 
And the first few minutes, about 20 minutes, I could tell he wasn't sure if I knew anything, but after about an hour and a half, I'd pretty well schmoozed him, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I came up with a few things he didn't know. He never heard of Execution Hollow, so that was pretty interesting. You ever heard of Execution Hollow? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> So th those are his classmates, and there's Sherman in all his glory, okay? Brigadier General. Um, I'm not going to go much in his career or everything, but he, he served on the Manhattan Project, but sadly, uh, well, I don't know if it's sad. Manhattan Project was what? The atomic bomb. So we dropped both the bombs on the 8th and the 12th um, of August, 1945, and Japan surrendered shortly thereafter. What? The Russians didn't know, Joseph Stalin, that was the only bombs we had, <laughs> we only had, well we had three, we blew one up in New Mexico, you know, at Alamogordo. I've, I've landed my Cobra helicopter on Trinity site, it's pretty cool, just a big slab now. You just land there, hovered, came to, I landed my helicopter there, it's pretty cool. All right, and so uh, we only had two bombs. So. So General uh, Hausbrook joined the Manhattan Project in 46 after the war because he'd been in the ETO. His highest award is the Legion of Merit. I decided today to be a little ostentatious, and that's what this is, the Legion of Merit. It's my highest award. I am just thrilled to get it. I don't know what the percentage is. The Lieutenant Colonel is probably 5 or 10% received this award. It was my retirement award. Um, so you have the Medal of Honor. And everyone looked me in the eye. I do this with every group because I have a book out on it. There's no such thing as the Congressional Medal of Honor. No such thing. All right? Is that heresy? Am I blasphemy? Am I blaspheming? No such thing as the Congressional Medal of Honor. There is, however, the Medal of Honor. Okay? And you don't win it, and you don't earn it. It's not the lottery, it's not a foot race. You don't earn it like a PhD. If we could earn the Medal of Honor, I had three by now, and I'd gladly sacrifice maybe Michelle, my wife, but maybe not, but at least my, all five kids, my house, anything for the Medal of Honor. You know, you have to have priorities in life, okay? So, um, Medal of Honor. Distinguished Service Cross, number two, and then the Distinguished Service Medal, and then the Silver Star, and then the Legion of Merit, and then Distinguished Flying Cross, Purple Heart, uh, Bronze Star, and so on down. So um, Hasbrook had a, a great career. He did great things. And he's one of these, as I said to Paul, I think, on the telephone today. He's either a minor major historical character or a major minor historical character. He's not a household name. But in this area, he's well thought of. He's honored, as he should be, because he's a hometown boy. We all have our hometown. Well, some people are born in military families and they <laughs> don't really have a hometown. But, uh, you know, he is one of those guys that just put his shoulder to the wheel and pushed on. Did his job, no accolades, and and served. And if you look at his career, he was in the Philippines. He was um, all these different places, different units, serving artillery for a while, engineering for a while, and he he just had a just one of those wonderful careers. And uh, and he is the, the 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 potatoes and gravy kind of person of of America that we all honor and respect. So, um, closing here, the aspect of uh, the legacy of West Point. Freedom's the bulwark of liberty. It is an institution. And if you think of institutions, the first one that comes to my mind is the family. And then, our communities and maybe our churches, but we have other institutions, the Supreme Court, Congress, maybe buildings, the Capitol building in a way, but West Point, the United States Military Academy is an institution. And all the things that we've done, and I've already enumerated some of these. 
and it, we represent the nation. We have about, um, if you look at our demographics, which is really interesting, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are. If you're a hard worker and you're a good student in high school and you have some leadership ability, and if you maybe played some sports here and there, but you've been in 4-H and all these other things, Eagle Scout, you know, Girl Scout and so on, you have a good chance of getting in because it's grades merit what you've done. It's not who you're related to. That's the way the European system was of orders, of aristocracy. And that's what Jefferson wanted to prevent. And that's what we have. So can congressmen nominate the cadets? Both of you were nominated by your congressman and appointed. There's at large, there's presidential, vice presidential, Sons and daughters of recipients of the Medal of Honor, if they meet the minimum, the standards, they can receive an appointment to the military academy. What are the best programs we have in all, all the service academies? So you have the Army, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, the Coast Guard Academy, and what's the last one? Merchant Marine. Merchant Marine. So the Coast Guard and Merchant Marine are rather small in numbers, but they're still there and they're federal institutions. But to go through what we call United States Military Academy a Preparation School, where enlisted soldiers, about 246 are appointed each year to go through a year of intense study in English and now science too, but also math, to prepare them for a, an appointment to the Military Academy. 2010, the first captain, the senior ranking cadet on campus among the brigade was a young soldier, two tours to Iraq, wounded, saw a bunch of his buddies die, use maps, the prep school, into West Point, and he was the first captain. And who were some of the first captains over time? Robert E. Lee, Pershing. Jonathan Wainwright, um, Douglas MacArthur were first captains. Pretty interesting. So, um, as, as I said, it's an absolute honor to be here and to speak to you. And did I go over time or how are we doing on time? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I just remembered. I, I, I want to take a few minutes, and I'm going to pass this around. Okay, I brought this. This is the howitzer of the class of 1920, the class that um, General Hausbrook graduated from. What's interesting, he's not in it. His picture's not in there. I mean, I know how to do alphabet, and he's not in there. I don't know why he's not in there. That happens on occasion. But you'll see, I'll pass this around. So please, no one steal it. I got this from the chief of staff's office. He doesn't know I took it. So, uh, but I'll re return it without him knowing about it. So uh, uh, I'm going to pass this around. So I'm going to have David Corper keep his eyes on it the whole time, all right? So I'm going to pass this around. And um, you can go ahead and take a look at it. So we'll have a few minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Are we uh, thank you, Sherman. That, that was. Uh, we got a, a, we learned a bit about West Point, a little bit about Sherman, and I, you know, when I was younger, I, I had wanted to go to West Point. Uh, that was a dream that I'd had, and um, and then younger? I, younger, younger, yeah, younger. Okay. This is, this was pre seventh grade, or no eighth grade, and I went to a basketball camp at West Point. It was during the summer, and I watched as the plebes marched up and down, starting at about three thirty or four o'clock in the morning all day, half of them were on crutches, and I said, you know what? <laughs> you know, so I guess I, I wasn't cut out for it. Um, but Sherman, thank you so much. And I have a, a couple little tidbits on, on Sherman Hasbrook. Uh, one is that he came up with an idea that, that recently, well, in the past decade, has come back. One of the uh, assignments that he had was uh, General Hasbrook was assigned to Nicaragua. And one of the things that he did was oversaw some of the elections that occurred there. Uh, corruption was unbelievable at that point. And he came up with a great idea that after you voted, you had to put your thumb in ink. 
so it, they would know that you couldn't vote twice. Great idea, right? The only problem was, uh, as one of the generals in Nicaragua said, it, it didn't matter. They didn't count the votes anyway. So it didn't <laughs> solve that problem. But this idea recently came back, and it's used in Afghanistan now. Uh, and Iraq. And Iraq. Uh, so he came up with that idea. Uh, and he, he was he seemed to be a, a pretty down-to-earth guy. In fact, uh, Hugh Reynolds had met with him at his home on a number of occasions, and never once during the talks that they had did he ever mention that he was part of the Manhattan Project, which is pretty impressive, because believe me, if I was even near the building of the Manhattan Project, you would all hear about it each and every month, but <laughs> it's pretty, pretty impressive. And then an, uh, another, a more human story, Ken Darmstadt, who often comes here, runs Darmstadt overhead doors, told me that he would go to uh, General Hasbrook's house about two or three times a month. Because what would happen is General Hasbrook, as he got a bit older, his driving skills deteriorated significantly. And what he would do was smash into the side of his uh, garage door <laughs> repeatedly. And instead of stopping, he would just kind of drive right through. So Ken said he would always get called, but Ken loved it because every time he went there, they would talk about you know, the, the war and his experiences. And he really was an amazing guy. And to think that someone, one of our neighbors, uh, again, here's a man who he went all over the world during his military career, but he came back here, came back to where he, where he grew up and he spent the rest of his life here. And again, he died at 103. He was very involved with West Point for the, his entire life and spent many years as the oldest living cadet where he would talk at, at functions. So again, Sherman, we thank you very much. We thank our special guests here. We thank you for what you're doing now. And we, more importantly, thank you for what you're going to do. Uh, we appreciate you having you here, and it's, it's an honor. Um, as always, yes. And again, I, I saw that plebe summer. It was it was brutal, brutal. And uh, you know, it's it's an, it, we thank you for for again everything that you that you do. Uh, we do want to take the opportunity to thank everybody who makes this possible. Um, I used to go through the name. It, it keeps getting longer and longer. So we appreciate what everybody does to make this possible. It is a wonderful uh, series. And and again, we like Sherman Hasbrook. You're somebody that I had no idea. And I thank Vince DeLuca. Uh, particularly for bringing uh, Sherman Hasbrook up, for, for sharing his experiences with him and, and letting us all know a little bit about him. Uh, and again, I, I would like to let people know about our upcoming presentations. Arthur Wicks, the cleaner who controlled the Senate. That's a, that's a good title, isn't it? That's a good title. Well, our own Hugh Reynolds is going to be talking about him. Arthur Wicks was a member of the New York State Senate, and he is the reason why the thruway is on this side of the river. Um, and he's also the reason why we have exits at Kingston and Saugerties. Is that correct, you? So we're going to learn uh, all about him and New Paltz. Uh, I, I knew we had an exit there. I didn't know he was responsible for that one, but he was. Uh, on April 17th, we have uh, Stonehouses, our history in stone. Uh, Mark Yalom has a, uh, a blog and a Facebook page. If you may be on that, many of you, and he follows a lot of the stone houses, talks about the history of them, what they're about. So he's going to come and talk to us in April. Uh, so thank you again, Sherman. We thank you for, for this enlightening co uh, conversation tonight. Again, we want to thank our special guests uh, from the, the cadets from West Point, and we want to thank all of you. Everybody, try and stay warm. We appreciate you coming out, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>